Okay, let's do the third side of the chapter 9 through 11 physics practice test. Um, starting with number 13 here. So let's see, Emma is massless, so we're going to ignore, of course, that people can't be massless, but we ignore her weight because she's holding 50 kilogram masses, 110 pounds. Okay, not very realistic, but she's pretty strong. Out in her hands, each one meter from the center line of her body. That means her arms are a meter long. That's pretty long arms. And spins at 15 rotations per minute, 15 RPMs, and the tips of her frictionless ice skates. She then pulls in each hand 0.6 meters. How fast is she spinning now? What is her new spin rate? 15 RPMs, right? That 15 rotations per minute. That means one rotation every four seconds. You know, that's reasonable. It's not so crazy. Spin around four times every four seconds, which gives you 15 per minute. Okay, so first thing we draw a picture. So here's Emma in the middle, and here is 50 kilograms out here. We'll just do everything in kilograms. So I'll write 50, 50 out here, 50, this is one meter. And she's, let's pretend we're looking at from above. So it doesn't matter which way she's spinning. Let's say she's spinning this way. Okay. So she has 50 meters spinning in a radius of one meter, and there's two of them. So angular momentum. Angular momentum. Momentum you have because you're moving in a circle at an angle. You're changing your angle. That's where the angular comes from. Angular momentum is given the letter L because I guess the lur in there, they didn't want to call it A, they didn't want to call it M because there's already regular momentum. So anyway, they give the letter L and it is equal to the rotational inertia, which makes sense, it's I for inertia. How hard is it to spin something in a circle? So it's rotational inertia times how fast you're spinning it, the angular speed, omega, Greek letter omega. So I omega is equal to the, rho, the angular momentum. For simple situations, where all the mass is a certain distance from the center of rotation, then we have the simple formula that the rotational inertia is the mass, which in this case is 50 times the radius squared. That only works if all the mass is a certain distance from the center. Okay, so if it's a solid object, you know, there's more complicated ones. They work some out in the book. They tell you what they are. It's like two thirds mr squared or one half mr squared. This is the biggest it can be. All the mass goes in the full circle. This is the biggest, the rest of them are always fractions of mr squared. Okay, that's our rotational inertia. So, in the beginning, when they're one meter apart, in the beginning, the rotational inertia, there's two of them. So it's the mass, 50, times the radius, which is one squared, it's easy math, plus there's another one, 50 times one squared. So one squared is one, so that's 100. Okay, and the units would be kilogram meter squareds, but we'll just make sure everything's in kilograms and meters and everything will be okay. Okay, now that's before, so I'll call that IB. I after, IA for after, after she pulls her arms in, still 50, but now she pulls them in 0.6, in 0.6, which means now it's 0.4 from the center, right? If she pulls them in 0.6 or 0.4, so it's 0.4 squared plus the same one over here. It's 0.4 squared. Um, 0.4 is 0.16. So let me do that in my calculator. Um, 0.4 times 50. That's 8. Each one is 8. So now it's 16. So her rotational inertia went from 100 to 16. In other words, she's like 100 divided by 16 times easier to spin. It's much easier to spin something if all the mass is in the center. So she becomes much easier to spin. Now, here's the idea. As long as it's frictionless, the angular momentum can't change. If you have a certain amount of mass going in a circle, a certain amount of momentum, because you have mass going in a circle, and if it's frictionless, which we're assuming it is, that can't change. So the L before has to be equal to the angular momentum afterwards. Okay, so... The angular momentum is I before omega before has to be equal to the I after omega after. Well, omega before was 15. Okay, it was 15. And I before we just figured out was 100. So we have 100 times 15 is equal to I after we figured out was 16 times her new spin rate, omega 
a, which we don't know omega after. But it's just 100 times 15 divided by 16. So her omega, her spin rate afterwards, is 100 times 15 divided by 16, which is 100 times 15 divided by 16 is going to be 93.75. 93.75, and we're dealing with RPMs here, so that many rotations per minute, which is, if it was 60, it'd be one a second, right? So this is like one and a half times a second. So she sped way, way up, which is what would happen if you pull your arms in. Um, if you watch, I suggest you Google like ice skaters spinning, um, and you know they put their legs out and their arms out and go as fast as they can. Then they pull their 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 legs and arms in, or okay, one leg. You can't have both legs out. You pull your leg in, and they go way, way, way faster, crazy fast in a circle. Um, same thing if you put you know your arms out and you're spinning in a, on a stool that's really spinny or a chair that's got hardly any friction. Pull your arms in, you're going to go a lot faster. Um, we do this stuff in class. If we had class, let's feel it. Anyway, it's pretty fun. So try that. But that's the idea. The basic physics is momentum, angular momentum is conserved. It doesn't change because there's no outside force, no friction or anything. So if you decrease your moment of inertia, you increase your spin rate because they have to multiply to the same thing. Have to multiply to what they were in the beginning. Okay, pretty cool. Okay, another spinning thing going on here. Um, doesn't seem like it, but it is. You have a 900 kilogram and 700 kilogram musk oxen walk across a 1400 kilogram bridge. If you don't know what a musk oxen is, Google musk oxen. Blah, musk oxen. They're the most cool animals. They live way up north in the Arctic. They're my favorite animal. They're, they're awesome. So they're walking across a bridge. The 901 lies 30 meters across the 80 meter long bridge. The 701 lies 70 meters across. Find the weight on the, each of the two end supports of the bridge. Okay, first to draw a picture of the bridge. So here's the end support, look like a fulcrum. Here's our bridge, put the other support <clears throat> in the eye. So it's a 1400 kilogram bridge. Just like the meter stick, it's as if the entire bridge is hanging at the center. So here's our 1400 hanging at the center here. And we'll just do everything in kilograms and meters so we know the units will work out right. Okay. We have a 901 lies down 30 meters across. So this is at 40, halfway. This is at 80. We'll call this zero. So we have a 901 30 meters across. So that's about right here. So we'll hang our 900 kilogram musk oxen here. And then the 701 lies down 70 meters across, which is like right about here. This is 30. So let's say 70 right about here. So we have our, uh, barely fit it in here, 701 there. Okay, so now what must each support be holding? Okay, so imagine you're carrying this bridge with a friend. Who's going to be holding more weight? This person on this side or this person? And you can see that, well, this 700 is really close to the end. So this person's going to be holding most of the 700. The heavier one, though, is this person, this one's gonna be holding more, but it's a little bit further away, so not as much more. And the 1400's evenly split, right? If there are no musk oxen, each person's holding 700, because it's right in the middle. So, which one wins? A heavier one, but it's further away from this person, or the 700 closer? Um, and so that's what we can figure out. So, how do we do this? The overall idea is here, that the sum of these things all want to make the bridge turn. You can imagine it wants to make it turn. The sum of the torques has to be equal to zero. The way that people write that in like a physics book is the sum, this big E means summing, of all the torques, which is given the letter T. Sum of the torques is zero. Torques are turning forces, or else it would turn, which means something would break, right? You'd drop it. You wouldn't be able to hold it. So as long as it's static, as nothing moves, the sum of the torques is zero, the turning forces. Now, you might think reasonably, well, nothing's turning here. And that's true, but it wants to turn. So here's how you do this. You pretend you choose either one. I'm going to choose this one. Make pretend this is the fulcrum, and everything's spinning about this fulcrum, this triangle here. Okay? Therefore, these, the 900 wants to make it spin this way, wants to make it spin this way, wants to make it spin this way. That's clockwise, right? Clocks go that way. So they're all clockwise. But this fulcrum is pushing up. 
it's counteracting the fact that those all three want to spin. So it's the counterclockwise force. And how far they are from here is the fulcrum distance. This is 80, this force is acting 80 from this one. This one's acting 30, 40, 70 from that one. So the torques have to be equal. So the, you set the clockwise ones, clockwise equal to the counterclockwise torques. Again, we have three clockwise. These guys all want to turn this way, and this force here, this person lifting up, was making it turn counterclockwise. It wants to make it spin that way. Okay, torque is force times distance. So the sum of the forces times the distance, right? So that's just equal to the sum of the force times the distance. So this force, and again, there's a gravity everywhere. They're going to cancel out. So all we got to worry about are the masses here. This force is 900, the distance is 30. So we have a 900 times 30, I'm gonna put it in parentheses, keep it clear, plus this one is 1400 times 40, because it's 40 from that fulcrum. So 1400 times 40, and the last one is 700 times 70. Again, we're pretending that it's rotating about this thing. So 70 away from it. That's gotta be equal to this one, which we'll call it F because we don't know what it is. What's the force going upwards, which will be in kilograms. So F times 80, because it's 80 away. <clears throat> well, this is all, we're gonna add all those up, divide it by 80, and we know how much, how many kilograms this supports holding. Okay, so this is, let's see, 27 with three zeros, four times 14 is 56, so plus 56 with three zeros. And this one is 49 with three zeros equals 80F. Um, see those things add up to 27 plus 56 plus 49 is 132,000. So our F is equal to 132,000 divided by 80, divided by 80 which is equal to 1650 kilograms. That's what this side of the bridge is holding up. Now the total is, the, between the two sides, they got to hold up all the weight, right? Which is 900 plus 700 is 1600 plus 1400, which is 3000. So the total that's being held up is 3000 kilograms. Okay, if, if this one's holding up 1650, so this is 1650, this one's holding up the rest of it, so one side is 1650, and the other side is 3,000 minus 1650, what's left, which is 1350 kilograms. So this sport over here is holding up 1650, uh, 1350, a little bit less, and that makes sense, because this 900, even though it's on its side of the bridge, it's further over, it's closer to the middle. So this one's taking a lot of the 900, and by far most of the 700. So if these were people carrying it, this person is going to be carrying 300 kilograms more, 16 for 1650 versus 1350. Okay, that's how you do these. Um, a common problem with this is like in cars, like how much weight's in the front wheels, how much in the back wheels. Um, you do it the same way. You see, okay, where is the engine? How much does that weigh? How much does the truck weigh? You know, you put that in the center, how much, or the truck without the engine, how you put a bunch of hay in the back or something. Um, how much does that weigh? Where is that located? And you can figure out the weight on either wheel. Um, lots of applications of doing this. It's a very common engineering thing. And it's pretty cool. And again, the whole point is the sum of the turning forces is zero when you choose one thing to make pretend it's all turning about that. All right, last one. Space station. You want a space station with a G equals 0.4, which means you're going to be pretty light, right? Things will fall. You can put something down, you know, and your pencil will go down because there is some gravity, but not very much. Okay, so Callan doesn't want to weigh much. She wants it to spin three times a minute. <clears throat> if you spend more than once a minute, they say you'll get dizzy eventually. Not right away, but like all day long, pretty soon you start feeling woozy. Three times a minute, once every 20 seconds. That's not so bad. But again, eventually you would get dizzy. But Callan doesn't get dizzy easily. So what must its radius be? How big must it be? Okay, the basic physics here is that the centripetal force is supplying your gravity. Mass doesn't matter. We want the radius, so we have V squared 
over, let's say, well, if we have v squared over r equals g. We want g is 0.4. We want the radius, but we don't know what the velocity is. So how fast is this thing moving? Okay, well, let's see. If you're going in a circle, your velocity <coughs> is is the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, divided by the time it takes to go in a circle. So how long does it take to go in a circle? Um, we know that it's going to be, say, three times a minute. That's what we'd call omega, the spin rate. And the period to go in a circle, that's how many circles per minute. So we want minutes per circle. So we just flip that upside down. So the period is always 1 over omega. So the number of minutes per circle is 1 over the number of circles per minute. You flip it upside down. So that's just 1 third. But that's, so yeah, so one third of a minute, which we knew that anyway, we could do that in our heads. So the period is one third minutes, but we want seconds, so we multiply by 60 seconds per minute, and we get the number that we could do in our head. Sometimes you can't do the math easily in your head, so it's important to be able to do this, but one third of 60 is 20 seconds. So our velocity then is two pi, we don't know the radius yet, but we do know that period is 20 seconds. So we can get rid of everything but the r. Um, 2 times pi divided by 20 is 0 0.314. It's kind of close to pi there. So 0.314. And it's because it is pi, right? The 2's cancel out here. So it's basically pi divided by 10. Um, so 0.314 um, r. And that will be in, in per seconds, right? This is in meters and this is in seconds. So our velocity is 0.314 r in meters. And that will give us our velocity in meters per second. So we can plug that in over here. So velocity is 0.314 r. So 0.314 r squared, so our v squared, divided by r is equal to g, which is 0.4. See, the r in the bottom cancels out the r, the square r squared in the top. So we have, let me just write this again. So 0.314 squared times r. I'll just write it all out. r squared over r that cancels out the r squared equals 0.4. We have our r here. r in the bottom cancels out. So r is equal to 0.4 divided by 0.314 squared. So let's do that. Um, times 0.4. I get 4.052. Let's say 4.05. So 4.05 meters. So her space station is going to have a radius of 4.05 meters. Typical persons are you know, around two meters tall. It's about six feet, a um, little less, whatever. So, you know, that's a reasonable size space station. Not very big, but you know, way taller than your head. Um, and that's, again, if you want to spin only three times a minute, um, you'll have a little bit of gravity. Um, the faster you spin, the more gravity you'll have. Okay, so that's how you figure this out. Um, hopefully these all made sense. Let me know if you're having any trouble. And um, we'll get on to the next page. Thanks for listening.